Welcome to the first episode of Capital Roots, brought to you by Capital Farm Credit, where we bring you the experts in the ag industry. What he did after winning the Nobel Prize is he, he thought, you know, we need to create a prize that is focused on agriculture. So one of the things we do in Texas 4 youth Livestock and Ag is a lot of leadership programs. So Capital's been a big sponsor of ours for about a decade to those, you know, livestock ambassadors, equine ambassadors. In addition to a few Texas legends along the way. We're your hosts, Joe Patronella and Clint Cryer. Thank you for listening. Now let's get back to our roots. Welcome back to Capital Roots. This week, we've got Billy Zanellini with the Borlaug Youth and Ag Program and Dr. Elsa Morano with the Borlaug International Institute for Agriculture. Well, thank you very much. Howdy. And uh, forgive my voice. I've I'm, I'm been dealing with a little bit of laryngitis here. Um, but um, I've been at Texas A&M University as a faculty member for 27 years. Uh, and in that time frame, had different kinds of roles. I was the vice chancellor and dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, uh, president, first woman, uh, shortest uh, president of the university. We focus on the first. Exactly. And then over the last uh, 10 or 11 years, I've been privileged with uh, serving as director of the Norman Borlaug Institute for International Agriculture and Development, as you, as you said. Um, well, my background is, is really, um, I'm a food safety uh, expert. And so that means uh, looking at the organisms that can be found in food, whether raw or processed foods that could hurt us, salmonella, E. coli, those kinds of things. So that was my, my entry into the world of agriculture through fruit, food science, really. And uh, it was actually a um, project that was done um, by Texas A&M before the Borlaug Institute actually existed as such um, in Central America uh, to help farmers there after a hurricane. Uh, in 1998, more or less, um, recover from that hurricane, I was asked if I would go in and try to uh, provide them some training on how to start to grow their fruits and vegetables, but do it with a mindset towards food safety to try to minimize contamination and so forth. So I thought, well, I'm a research scientist. You know, what am I doing? Going to, to a place to, to train farmers, but okay, fine, I'll do it. And so when I did, it just really uh, brought to life to me the importance of agriculture and something that the good Dr. Borlaug said always, which was take it to the farmer. Knowledge for knowledge's sake doesn't help anybody. We have to take it to the people who actually will benefit and can implement it and use it. And I think that's so important because classically people think of agriculture as production, right? Mm -hmm. And food safety doesn't get... uh, lumped into agriculture. So I like that. And I think that's very important to share in our message of ag- advocacy for ag. So um, going into Dr. Borlaug, because I think that's what we're all here for today. Sir? Um, mm-hmm. You had a relationship with him and, and you carry on his legacy. Can you tell me a little bit more about him? Well, Dr. Borlaug um, was a, uh, an agronomist. He uh, developed varieties of different kinds of row crops And so uh, back in the 1960s, he was working as a researcher at an international research center for maize and wheat in Mexico. And he developed a variety of wheat, a dwarf variety of wheat that would grow really well in parts of the world that were starving to death at that time, Mexico, Pakistan, India. And so he introduced those varieties uh, in those countries, and it saved so many people. In fact, he's been credited with having saved a billion lives. I saw that. That's staggering. Unbelievable. That's so for that reason, in 1970, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. There's no Nobel Prize for agriculture, so he got the Nobel Peace Prize, but that's fine. And, you know, he was actually working in the field, and his wife uh, received the call from the Nobel Committee and had to tell Dr. Borlaug, hey, you got the Nobel Prize. And he's like, don't bother me. I'm busy. I'm, I'm working. He was very work focused. And so uh, I had the privilege of uh, meeting Dr. Borlaug when I came to Texas A&M in 1995. Um, He was um, teaching here part-time, already, you know, past retirement and so forth, but it was still engaged very much. He was living in Dallas with his family. And so he would come down here uh, occasionally to teach. And so uh, he was giving a lecture to some food science students. And I was a new professor in the uh, food science programs. So I thought, 
Norman Borlaug is here. I got to go see him. So I went to the lecture, and I'll never forget it because he said to the students there and anybody who was uh, present, um, how dare we in developed countries in the world um, not use science, such as biotechnology, for example, to help people who are starving to death around the world. So that was amazing. So I got to, to meet him and then uh, have many conversations with him. Um, you know, he, of course, in 1977, uh, then also got another award. He got the Presidential Medal uh, of Freedom from President Carter. 1977 is when I was graduating high school. So never in my wildest dreams would I think that I was going to meet Dr. Borlaug uh, so many years later. Uh, but then as time went on, um, I uh, became uh, the vice chancellor and dean of the college. And so I got to interact with Dr. Borlaug even more. And so in 2006, um, we uh, decided that we should put our international agriculture program, give it a, a kind of a structure um, more defined. And so I thought we should maybe form it into an institute. And he said to me at that time, Dr. Morano, call it the Norman Borlaug Institute, not because he wanted any accolades. He didn't need it. He said it'll bring attention to your work. And he was absolutely, completely correct. It has helped us tremendously to have that Borlaug name, which there's no other university in the United States that has a Borlaug Institute, much to the chagrin of the University of Minnesota, where he went to school, Iowa State University, uh, where he had lots of great relationships because he was from Iowa, uh, Cornell University, where he has uh, there his only uh, U.S. graduate student is kind of my counterpart. He directs their international agriculture programs, but uh, he's at not just Texas A&M. So it's been great for us. Uh, so an incredible person, very humble, very determined. Um, I talked about being short. He was about my height, which was great. I, really? Oh, yeah, You very can't tell short. from the pictures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so he and I would, you know, we've been to Washington, D.C. together to visit members of Congress and, um, you know, just very focus on his work uh, to the point that, frankly, all he cared about is, is really his work until his dying breath. So you made a good point there that's really astounding to me <clears throat> that he won the Nobel Peace Prize. And you made mm -hmm. a comment there about there's no Nobel Peace or Nobel Agricultural right. Prize. But I wonder, you know, not only with what his work was at Texas A&M, but across agriculture, if there's ever been any other ag-related individuals that won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, no, but I will say this to you. What he did after winning the Nobel Prize is he, he thought, you know, we need to create a prize that is focused on agriculture and not leave it to chance for the Nobel Committee to finally focus on agriculturalists. And so he, uh, through um, some contacts he had with uh, the Ruan family in uh, Des Moines, Iowa, uh, created the World Food Prize. And, wow. and this was 1986, 87. It has now become been regarded as the Nobel Prize for Agriculture. It's awarded every October in uh, Des Moines, Iowa. There's a huge ceremony, celebration. Uh, people from all over the, all over the world, uh, officials uh, and from the U.S. government attend the World Food Prize. And so the laureates are all focused on agriculture. I have the great privilege of serving on the uh, advisory committee for the World Food Prize Foundation. And it's just an amazing thing to see what people are doing, scientists, applying exactly what Dr. Borlaug said, applying science to elevate smallholder farmers out of poverty and hunger, which is the mission of the Borlaug Institute, by the way. Well, that's a great segue, because I was mm -hmm. going to ask you back, back to the <clears throat> Institute. Would you mind sharing with us some of the projects that y'all are doing and some of what you feel is your most important or most meaningful work? Oh, my goodness. I could tell if, you so, how, if so you could many. be here all day, I'm sure. Yeah, but. we could be here all day. I will tell you that, uh, you know, fairly recently, uh, we finished a project in Central America in three countries there, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, on coffee. And uh, the key is because we thought to mitigate not only hunger, okay, but also migration. Uh, why do people leave their home? Is because they need a, a source of, of, of income. And so what had been happening is uh, there's a disease of the coffee plant that ravaged Central America. 
killing all of their coffee plantations. And so the farmers had nothing to earn. They couldn't feed their families, and they would leave. So we, um, funded by the U.S. government, uh, developed a variety that is resistant to this uh, fungus. And so we introduced it to these three countries, did demonstrations for farmers, and we actually have it on video where the farmers are saying, we don't have to leave now. And, and they're looking at their harvest with tremendous satisfaction. So uh, that's just an example of the many projects that we do and have done over the years. A project that we have going on right now uh, all over Africa is on irrigation, something very, very important for agriculture, obviously, yeah. um, because you may know this, that in a lot of the rural villages in, in Africa, uh, for a farmer to irrigate their field, they have to wait for rain, and if it's not raining, it's not good. So if it's not raining, the, the mother or the woman of the house has to get a big tank of water, put it on her head, walk for miles to the nearest lake or river, fill it up, walk all the way back for hours, and that's the water for not only irrigating the fields, but for the family to use. That's not enough. So in this project, it's, a, it's an innovation laboratory for small-scale irrigation, we have provided um, solar-powered um, pumps so that the farmers can dig down below where there's the water, pump out the water, have enough water to irrigate their fields, use it for their families. And one of the side benefits has been that the, they've been able then to grow not only their normal crop, be it uh, wheat or corn or whatever it may be, sorghum, but they can also... Uh, now grow fruits and vegetables, feed their families, and diversify their diet. So had, we had seen with data that their nutritional uh, well-being has increased tremendously because of having a diversified diet with fruits and vegetables and meats and, and corn and everything else. So you may have mentioned it, and you mentioned several countries there, I think three in South America on the coffee project and then several <clears throat> across Africa, but I'm curious, you know, the reach of the Borlaug Institute, if you consider countries outside of the U.S., do you have any idea of how many different countries you've got? Sure, 48. 48. To be exact. Uh, we have worked, like I say, all over Sub-Saharan Africa, in Asia, many countries, Indonesia, for example, East Timor, Bangladesh. Uh, we have worked in, in Central America, in uh, the Caribbean, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq. So interesting. interesting places, to say the least. If, if you could opine on what Dr. Borlaug would think of what y'all are doing at the Institute, what, what do you think he would say or, or, or what his feelings would be? Well, I can tell you this. Um, every single day, we think about exactly that. Um, and my staff, uh, my great staff at the Borlaug Institute, I don't ever have to say, hey, get to work, you know, or you're lazy today because they know the mission, they've been to these places, they've seen the conditions in these places, and that's their big motivation. And to be right and do right for Dr. Borlaug, you think that he's looking down at us every day and saying, hey, people, come on. So, uh, so we think about it every day. Um, I can tell you a, a little bit of a story. When I was first getting acquainted with Dr. Borlaug, one time I was having uh, lunch with him, and uh, this was early on, so he said to me, uh, Dr. Morano, what do you do? And I said, I'm a food microbiology professor here at Texas A&M. And he said, well, what do you do that helps people directly? And I said, well, I do research on microbial pathogens that can hurt people. He said, yeah, but that's you in the lab. What do you do that helps people directly? He said, well, I, I published that research and presented at scientific meetings. He says, yeah, but that's just scientists like you. What do you do that helps people directly? I said, well, uh, I teach. I have students. Those are people. He said, yeah, but you're teaching them to become like you. What do you do that helps people directly? So I finally said, well, nothing, Dr. Borlaug. Okay? He stayed on it. Hey, exactly. <laughs> so he smiled at me, pointed his little finger at me. He said, whatever you do in life, he must help people directly. And I never forgot that. That was years before I became director of the Borlaug Institute. So I think about that all the time. Yep, yep. 
You make me think of a personal story. When I got out of school, you know, I thought I knew it all. I was well educated, <clears throat> so I thought, and I thought, you know, I'm ready to be the CEO second day on the job. Sure. But one thing that I figured out really quickly is that I had a, a head full of theory. I didn't know how to apply it. <laughs> I didn't know how to affect people's lives in the sense of yeah. what the, the mission of the company that I worked for was. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I wanted to mention is that uh, Dr. Borlaug got the uh, uh, Congressional Gold Medal in 2007, and I have a replica of it here, and I don't know if it's easy to see it, but the back of this uh, gold medal Okay, that Congress awarded Dr. Borlaug says uh, words that he uttered himself. In fact, when he was accepting the Nobel Prize early on, which says, the first essential component for social justice is adequate food for all mankind. So an amazing message to say that this is what drove Dr. Borlaug. This is what he was all about, is... uh, making sure that there was adequate food for all mankind. I can pass that around and you can take a look at it. You, you handed it to me earlier outside. I know. And I was it's, astounded by the weight. It's and amazing. You told me that the real ones are even heavier than this. That's Indeed. And his family who live in Dallas, uh, they oh, have God. all his medals. Uh, just an amazing individual. I wanted to share with you very quickly, um, also since I'm here now, uh, with Trops. Okay, there we go. This is a picture that I love. Uh, is me and Dr. Borlaug going down uh, the processional during commencement at Reed Arena. Um, This is uh, in 2007 uh, when we gave Dr. Borlaug an honorary PhD. Uh, Now, that was not easy to do, believe it or not, because, uh, and he had received honorary PhDs from universities all over the world. So when I was uh, the dean of the college, I thought, well, you know, we need to give him an honorary PhD. And my staff at the time told me, well, we can't, Dr. Morano. There's a policy that says that because he's teaching, he's technically an employee, and we cannot give honorary PhDs to employees. So I went to uh, uh, Dr. Gates, our president Gates at the time, and I asked him, you know, what can we do about this? And he says, well, at the next Board of Regents meeting, I'll have you present your proposal to them. So sure enough, the day came, and I explained to them, I understand the policy, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just asking, could you make an exception for anyone who's earned a Nobel Peace Prize, a Congressional Medal, or Gold Medal, a National Medal of Science, and then a Presidential Medal uh, of Science from uh, President George W. Bush? And so they laughed, and they said, of course. Just we will few. make yeah. an exception for anyone who's gotten all of those things. And so this was the day that uh, we gave him that honorary degree. And uh, at that time, you know, you can see he was up in years. He was in his 90s. And I was afraid that he might uh, stumble on the steps as you get up to the stage. And so as I'm worrying about this, how do I see if I can help him up the stairs? Because I didn't want him to stumble. He says to me, Dr. Morano, may I help you up the stairs? (laughs) And that just tells you the character of the man. He was always thinking about somebody else, not himself. I just want to end by saying to you what were Dr. Borlaug's uh, words when he passed away in 2009. I had the great privilege of being with him a few days before he passed away up in Dallas. And he said to me, Elsa, don't let the dream die. Which, again, I think about that constantly. Uh, But a few days after, when he was actually moments before passing, Uh, his family surrounding him, his last words uh, were really what you can see in this very magazine. He was very much a believer of taking it to the farmer. So his last dying words were take it to the farmer. So his last moments of life, that's all he cared about. So an incredible altruistic human being, uh, incredible example to all of us. he believed very much in um, youth development. That was one of his important uh, principles that, yes, take it to the farmer, but somebody has to teach these kids to be the, the hunger fighters of tomorrow. And so uh, we're so glad that we have programs here at Texas A&M, youth programs that carry forward that legacy of Dr. Borla. So thank you.
And that's what we're getting to next. But I certainly don't think you've let his dream die, and he'd be proud of the work you're doing. So thank you so, thank much. You so much. Carried it thank on. You. So speaking of youth programs, we've heard from Dr. Murano about Dr. Borlaug's uh, affinity for youth programs. You're here to talk about the Borlaug Youth and Agriculture Program. Tell that's, us a little bit about that. That's right. Yeah, it's uh, it's got a pretty interesting story, and and definitely. Uh, I'm going to try to shorten it up for you all today, but it started really back in uh, 2012, the idea about it. I know it seems like a long yeah. time ago, uh, but uh, Dr. Morano and I have a mutual friend and, and Dr. Mike Engler, who is uh, with Cactus Feeders. And we used to have him come in and speak to our ambassadors. So one of the things we do in Texas 4-H Youth Livestock and Ag is a lot of leadership programs. So Capital has been a big sponsor of ours for for about a decade to those, you know, livestock ambassadors, equine ambassadors. So we had ambassadors up in Lubbock and he and he and Mr. Ross Wilson came down to do a talk and an angler is very good about talking about how sustainability fits into fed cattle. And we wanted to hear that from him, but he'll come into a room and, you know, he would always ask our kids, he'd be like, okay, so hands up, who knows who Dor uh, Norman Borlaug is? And so we have built this as like we've recruited the best and brightest in agriculture in Texas. And it was always embarrassing that zero or one hand would go up, you know, and they wouldn't know. And he would always give me this look like that's unacceptable. You're a loser. Do better, <laughs> you know? And I was like, give okay. So, so, but this was an annual thing and he would come in and ask this and uh, it got to about 2016 or no, 2017 and he followed up you know, my failure of introducing our kids to Norman Borlaug with an email and Double copied down. the vice chancellor and said, look, Zanellini needs help on, you know, getting out the Borlaug legacy and getting kids engaged in what at the time is the, the youth institute it actually happens up in Des Moines. He wanted more Texas participation mm -hmm. and thought that I could be kind of a connected point to that. So, so anyway, I was like, okay, um, Dr. Engler's serious. Like I need to, I we need to make look, this happen. I need to look into Dr. Borlaug. So sure enough, get on Amazon, find a book I like and, and buy it. And, um, it didn't take me long to get absolutely infected. You know, we heard from Dr. Murano, you know, his impact. And I think what can't be lost, you know, the billion lives is, is so impressive, right? It's, it's just mind blowing, it's but, but it's also relatively abstract, but like, like the here and now, is like there's kids that are going to open up presents at Christmas. There's generations that have been carried forward because he saved their life through wheat. And I think that that is part of what Engler's frustration was, was that if we're in agriculture, we should know who that is. Like if I go to a basketball court in any city in this country, the chances of them knowing who LeBron James yep. or Kobe or Michael Jordan, they're going to know who that is. So Borlaug for agriculture, that's our Michael Jordan. We got to yeah. know our superstar. We, yep. we, we should know our superstar. And so when he comes into the room and, and we don't know, that's a, that's a, that was a problem. So um, working alongside of that, I'm trying to be brief here, is um, we developed a relationship with a gentleman uh, in Richards, Texas, which is about 40 miles here from campus. Um, his name is Bill Thomas, and he has a big ranch out there, 3,000 acres. And his passion was trying to get urban students to the ranch to learn more about it. And then likewise, he had a passion for the arts. He wanted the kids in the rural communities to know where their products were going, to know how to connect with those folks. And he was frustrated that, um, you know, in Austin, as people are making decisions for our state, it has a very heavy urban influence. You know, he always would say, one man, one vote. So that was kind of going on at the same time in this we started going out there in 2013. So the Thomas Ranch and Bill Thomas's thoughts were kind of swirling around in my mind. The Borlaug thoughts were kind of swirling around in my mind. We were actually at a ranch in Argentina with a leadership group at a study abroad. And we were at this ranch, it was um, El Desafio, which translates to the challenge. And I thought, that's exactly right. That is agriculture, right? It's a challenge. So that was kind of working as well. I tripped along, you know, I'm a podcast guy. Mm -hmm. right? We've yep. talked about this. Yep. So, uh, Malcolm, Ironically, before this came to fruition. Yeah, right. right. So, um, but the difference is, uh, you know, people want to hear from <laughs> the people, not me, but, <laughs> or me, yeah. uh, but Malcolm Gladwell's revisionist history. And anyway, he was, he was actually being very critical of like Ivy League schools and all the big endowments and everything else that are there. 
But one of the comments he made was he enlightened me on a, a biomedical scholar program at Stanford where they recruit the best and the brightest talent to work on the problems of the day in the biomedical field. Huge funded deal, big. But anyway, I was like, man, he's bringing, they're bringing together all these different backgrounds. And that's kind of what Borlaug did when he was trying to solve hunger. And it kind of does what Bill Thomas is after in terms of that. And so anyway, I started thinking, man, but there's something to this Borlaug thing. And so I started asking around a little bit, and I've just by chance run into um, Dr. Cross and, and Dr. Pond, uh, two giants in agriculture, in my opinion. And uh, I was telling them about Borlaug. I was telling them about this idea I was working on. And they said, well, you need to go see Dr. Morano. And I said, you mean like the former president of A and M and <laughs> former vice chancellor and the, the boss of the my boss of boss? Mm -hmm. I just need to what? Just call her up. And they're like, well, yeah, here's her cell phone number. Give her a call. And I was like, she's Couldn't not going to be more intimidating. <laughs> I was like, she's not going to take my call. And they're like, no, she will. She really will. So she absolutely took my call, uh, Dr. Morano. And she asked me to come to her office and we're sitting at this round table and she, she just gets her phone out after I kind of give her what we, our idea for the Borlaug Youth and Ag Program. It wasn't that at that point. It was just a youth and ag program, right, that engaged urban and rural audiences. And uh, and so she's like, click, and just hits a number on her phone. And, right and, there. And she, I said, what are you doing? She says, I'm, uh, I'm calling Jeannie Borlaug, uh, which is Dr. Borlaug's daughter. And so at this point, uh, I'm kind of freaking out a little <laughs> bit because, uh, as I mentioned, I was buying books, and this family had become famous to me. And uh, you know, what, what Dr. Morano didn't know is I'd been reading early in the morning, going through his work and, and, and listening and reading these stories about him saving lives and people drowning and people trying to keep on his legacy and like real stuff and him fighting with, uh, you know, royalty and administrators abroad and, and just the tenacity of this man. So all this was just kind of swirling and I'm like, oh my gosh, she's calling her. So she did. And, um, She's like, hey, Jeannie, I'm sitting here with, uh, your name's Billy? Because we like just met. Some guy. Some guy. <laughs> just showed up in my office, Dr. Cross sent him. And, uh, and he's got this idea to carry on your dad's legacy, and he'd like to use his name. And so, Billy, tell her about it. And so Boom. I'm like, on the spot. So uh, a little stressed out about that, but I think I got it out okay, because at the end of the day, um, she agreed to allow us to use uh, Dr. Borlaug's name to, to name the program. Awesome. So she followed up with an official email, you know, which which our admin wanted to see. And uh, so so that kind of that that piece was finished. But, uh, you know, we we start developing the program. I go to Des Moines uh, in 2019, mm -hmm. January, negative 19, met those super nice people up there, mm -hmm. met with Ambassador Quinn up there. He was incredibly nice. But. You know, I, I, what I was up there seeking was, uh, you know, a Borlaug 101 that I could share with our students. That way, when Dr. Engler comes to my class, he can ask and like all the hands go up him. and he's like, man, I'm not mad at you anymore, which is which is what I was after. <laughs> but, uh, you know, at the, end of, at the end of the day at the time, and they could have since developed it, um, they didn't have a curriculum for us to use for our high school kids. So um, so but he's like, man, you seem really enthusiastic about it. Why don't you just develop it? To which I did. And, and now when Dr. Engler shows up, like all the kids have been through Borlaug 101, so all the hands go up, and I, and I look somewhat like a superstar because I finally followed through this. So, so there, there was that, that piece of, of, of shoring up kind of the Borlaug name. Mm -hmm. We really love that spirit about him bringing people together for a one issue. And then, you know, I, you know when I was at the ranch in South America, El Desafio, which is the challenge, you know, in English, which I thought was a beautiful and fitting name yeah, for, for ranching and farming, right? Because yep. it is certainly challenge. a challenge. Yeah. So I love that. And, and then, I, and then I, I found that leadership program out at Stanford in the biomedical field where they were able to bring together top minds to solve biomedical problems of the day out there. And so all those things were kind of working together and they kind of coalesced into this program where... We had the spirit of Borlaug, which was bringing people together to work on hard problems. Theirs was hunger. We have our own problems today, right? Yep. But I love that idea. And then we had this ranch we could use, you know, 3,000 acres that was working cow-calf. It had timber on it. It has a giant house and meeting facilities. It has all these incredible ingredients 
for hosting a meaningful program for urban and rural kids. And it was going perfectly, our planning of launching this program in the fall of 2020. We were at our final planning meeting in March of 2020. We're sitting at the gas station in Richards, Texas. I get a call from the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. One of our staff members is there. There's been a problem at the barbecue Mm -hmm. and they're shutting the thing down, right? And so from that moment on, Mm -hmm. it has been a struggle to get this launched, right? For obvious reasons. So, you know, initially it was, okay, so we don't have access to the students. 4-H at this point was, was kind of back in business. Once we get to June, July, we're starting to do 4-H programs. Not so for Houston Independent School District and a lot of the partners that we had in the program. So, um, so fall of 2020 passes us by. We don't get to launch. And so, you know. Because you had your rule with 4-H, but you didn't have your urban. Exactly. Yeah. And the, the urban is key, right? Because there's, there's so many programs out there that are targeted on rural leadership that we host. And those are our people, and we, we connect with them. But the missing piece is, has been, at least for us, has been how do you convince people in urban Texas that what's happening out rural matters to them, like right now, and in a meaningful way, that they'll remember. Remember when they're talking to people, remember when they vote, remember as they go into their careers. Like, what's a meaningful way we can do that? Well, and that's not just a program-wide problem. That's an industry and nationwide Absolutely. program that we face every day. Absolutely. Too. So you can imagine my disappointment where we just can't get this thing launched. We think we have a good thing. Mr. Thomas is ready to have those, you know, HISD buses pulling in his yard. You know, we're going to launch this thing. And Dr. Morano's on our team. And and Dr. Engler's happy, and and we've you know we have this challenge component to it. We're gonna we're gonna have these kids working on these hard problems together, and uh, and so you know New Year's 2020, we're like, well, 2021 is gonna be our year. You know, it's gonna be incredible, and so we're gonna launch. And sure enough, you know, we get to uh, the middle part of January, and I get a call first thing in the morning from Mark Clem, uh, who's with the Texas A&M Foundation, and Mr. Thomas sadly passed away. Oh. And so the program that we sat down in his office and scratched out, you know, on how it would look and how it would work, it, it became clear to me that he wasn't going to be part of it, you know, at least on this earth, you know. And so um, that ranch is a gift to the Texas A&M University system, and we get to use it. But at the time of his passing, you know, we have it now a state and some different things, and so... The long and short of it is, is that we just couldn't, we couldn't get out there to do programming um, for obvious reasons. So now we don't have a home for 21 in the fall because we had been out there. We had, he had given us five acres to plant our wheat, our borlog wheat. We were planting borlog wheat out there. You know, everything was centered around the ranch. And uh, and so, you know, it was devastating um, because uh, first and foremost, he became, he was on our vision committee for Texas 4-H Youth Livestock and Ag. You know, he, he helped develop this program. The and he was a good friend. And, and he was so good to us. And then, and then he passed. And then, so that was, that was a, you know, a, a big thing for us to overcome. And then we had, well, we don't have a home for the program. So we can't launch in 21. And so at that point, we had HISD and Aldine and others on board to help share their students. We'd been recruiting in Harris County to get those kids in the program, and we didn't have a home for it. And so there I am, you know, as, as 21 is turning into 22, going, man, I hope 22 is the year. And so sure enough, we get, we get back into the schools in spring of 22, where recruiting's better than ever. Like we're, we're telling this story, and what people like about, about what we do is that we're trying to get people to work together yep. on hard things. You know, and, and I think people are kind of exhausted with people arguing yep. about they're tired of the, division. They're they're tired of the division. They see it everywhere they look. And what we're trying to do is bring people of different backgrounds. This is what Borlock did to work on a hard problem. And so people like that. And it doesn't matter if you're a D or you're an R or you're rural or you're or you're urban. People like that yep. because it's it's collaboration. It's, it's it actually feels good. It feels good. But also there's like an outcome that that we all can live with. Hopefully. And so uh, the ranch is still tied up. 
Like, I don't know if we're going to be able to use it. And then we get word that we're not going to be able to do programming out there in November of 22. And at this point, you good folks were the first ones to sign off as a partner uh, in this for the planting phase. So it's planting, growing, and harvest. It's six months long. That's how long it took Borlaug's life-saving wheat to grow in Mexico. And so, uh, so y'all had already signed on to help and support it. Which we're happy to do. And, yep. and I'm, we're so glad you did, but now, now I'm feeling pressure like, oh my gosh, what, what if we can't launch? And, and we had um, Cactus, actually, Feeders and Cactus Cares had given us funding. Corteva at that point had given us. And so there, and we have a vision committee set up and we have all these things. And it's like, you can't launch, you, you, you don't have a home. So then I was driving in, um, out in West Texas, which is a good place to do some thinking. Right? For sure. It's a good place to do some thinking. Great place to In between drive. Abilene and Lubbock. And it hit me that, um, you know, this, this uh, Borlaug Youth and Ag Program, it's not a place. It's an idea. You know, it's not a place. It's not Texas A&M. It's, it's not even Texas. You know, and it's not, it's not India, Pakistan. It's about bringing people together. And so it doesn't necessarily have to have a home, right? It just has to have borlog spirit and it's got to bring, bring people together to work on problems so we pivoted you know we decided we are going to launch and we just launched uh in november and you know the buses showed up from houston uh at the texas a&m conference hotel we stayed there and those students stayed with us for three days we took them through lots of different programs and programming we planted wheat we did lots of things and and we launched and so here we are. So they planted. They did. They, they we got the planning. Way. And, you know, there were some, so many neat moments from the course. But, um, you know, Jeannie Borlaug came down. Really? Yes, That's from awesome. Dallas. Wow. She drove down. And, uh, and she said, do you mind if I bring some of my family? We said, oh, my gosh, please bring them. And so she brought the Marshes, which is Jennifer, which is her daughter. Okay. And her husband, Dan. Okay. And then Sophia, which wanted a campus tour she's 12 but she's oh. already thinking ahead right get so, her on here let's get her yeah, no, let's so, get her down uh, so dr morano she she led them around but they had supper with us and, and Jeannie spoke and um and she was so good to our kids and she brought you know she brought the nobel peace prize and she brought all the medals that dr morano mentioned and these kids from all walks of life got to pick these things up and hold them and i'd never held a nobel peace prize so there I am, like, fanboying, oh my <laughs> yeah. gosh. Here, you, somebody in agriculture really won this, right? And of course he did, because when he did some work in Pakistan and India, they were actually shooting bombs, or missiles and, and dropping bombs on each other. He brought that's, peace through food. That's awesome context. Yeah, so, and, and you're getting to hold that in, in that piece of history, and more than that, you know, more than me getting to do it. It was a, a kid from inside 610 in Harris County. It starts to see a future in agriculture that they, you know, they had never imagined before. Yep. Well, that's a good way of phrasing it. And you mentioned earlier, you know, urban kids seeing an agricultural w way of life, which we not harp on that, but we, we bring that point up a lot in ag. Sure. But you also said, you know, an ag kid seeing something in the arts. Absolutely. And I don't think we put ourselves in that mindset a lot because it takes both sides seeing the other way. It right? does. And I have you know, having gone to law school, a lot of my close contacts, they have no idea what we do. Sure. And so I always try to bring them out to the ranch and be like, my cattle are not on, on concrete. Like right. they're in dirt, they're in grass. And once right. they see that, they really are happy to stay or they're really happy sure. to come back out. And so I'm curious, did, did the urban kids, did they open up? And maybe they didn't go into a closed minded because they were wanting to be a part of this project, but were they happy to be in it did they have a different mindset about agriculture afterwards and planting or tell me more about like the kids experience i guess yeah so the the, the purpose of the planning phase was um is science of ag so one of the things we really wanted to impress on everybody that came to the course so we had 36 kids come so that's 18 rule 18 mm -hmm. early. And so they, they came here we we wanted to show them that because i think one of the things that that we're all guilty of is like a guy in ag is 
is a guy on a tractor in overalls who's just, you know, driving. And that's it's all he has to think about. That's what we've been trained to think it is. It's just the field, and we have row crops right around us right here, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's the impression. <laughs> but what we wanted them to see was, like, there's so science behind everything we do. And there's really smart people. So they can see, uh, you know, the phenotypic imaging of plants. And they can see robots in their role in agriculture. They, you know, we, we took them and we, sh we showed them what a ruminant looks like. Not only that, but what's inside of it through cannulated cattle and, and then also advanced reproduction, you know, like having a, a, a reproductive track of a heifer out on the table for everybody to see, Wow! which freaks some of them out. But at the same time, you, you get to talk about it genetics and then you can always circle back to like, look, because of these genetics and these advancements we've made over time, now we have less cattle, right? And now we have less environmental impact. And because they're more efficient, we're feeding more people. And because we can do this phenotypic imaging, we're smarter about how we water. And so we can conserve. And so, like, there's really smart people thinking about this stuff all the time. And it, not only that, it's their passion. And so we wanted them to feel and experience that. And they did. So they're more educated about how far we've come. In the yeah. And, yep. and it's, it's not like it's not without risk because um, – a funny story is, is one of my favorites from Harris County. His name's Warren. Uh, so we did an anatomy lab with laying hens. So we're digest, di dissecting chickens, right? Mm -hmm. So each kid sits down, and there is a deceased chicken in front of them. And the, the poultry science is awesome, but they, they had the room just filled with undergrads and graduate students. And they're just going through there, and they're – they start dissecting these chickens, right? And so they're, you know, they're learning about different air pockets they have and where the heart and the kidneys and, you know, how things move through the system. And they're laying hens, so you get to see the 20 different stages of an egg from tiny all the way to a hard egg, and they're pulling these things out of a chicken, right? So this is a risk to take with people that haven't been around this. Yeah. So Juan's just kind of sitting back, and he's, like, touching it every once in a while. And so he sent us a, we have a group meeting now that's just hilarious. And so, you know, one of the things we do with our programs that makes them successful, I believe, is connectivity. And so you can have a program, you can have a big time, they can learn a lot, they can call it life-changing, but if you're not constantly connecting with them in the in-betweens, so between planting and growing, then we lose them. So group me has been incredible. This is not an endorsement. It's not an endorsement. <laughs> But group me is just what we're using. And Juan sent a picture from Thanksgiving, and it was tofu turkey. And he said, look, guys, I just I haven't been able to bring myself to eat poultry since our dissection, <laughs> which is hilarious because uh, we're sponsored by Pilgrims, the Texas Poultry Federation, American Egg Council. I mean, like, the list goes on, American Egg Board. The list goes on and on. I'm like, I failed you all. Um, I think we turned somebody away from poultry. But... The idea is, and the spirit of it is, is like we want them to feel it. We want them to know. And and the lesson from the the uh, you know the hen dissection was, how do we make it more efficient, and how do we give that hen a better life yeah. while still providing food? And like there's science there, and poultry science helped them understand that. But uh, so that was we talked a we talk a lot about getting outside of your comfort zone, which isn't new. Everybody says that, right? Get outside of your comfort zone, but. To put a, a student with a, with a deceased bird in front of them and ask them to cut it open is something that puts a lot of them, even our rural kids, yeah. it made them it queasy. Outside of the box. It's outside of the box. And it's, it's memorable, right? And so what we were doing initially was team building. So we're doing, we're out at the Texas A&M Ropes course. Like we're putting them in challenging environments. So we borrow ideas from like the military. Like if you go through hard <laughs> things together, Yep. you're more likely to stay together. So we're hard on them. Like they're going from six in the morning till 10 at night. And that's just how we roll. And it works for us. Yep. But, uh, but so this was our time to get our urban kids out of their comfort zone. Well, guess what? We're going to be in Houston in March and we are going to do some things in urban okay. Texas, the opposite related to food insecurity related to um, some of the arts that are gonna put some of our rural kids outside of their comfort zone. And they're gonna have more walking around knowledge of what makes urban people tick, 
where our commodities are going, who's using them, what are the gaps as it relates to food insecurity. I should talk about our wicked problems. So we've identified four wicked problems that these kids are working on together. Methane is one, mm. food insecurity, water, land fragmentation, which is urban sprawl. Yep. So those are issues we've picked that we have this perceived urban rural friction. Perfect issues. And so if Texas gains a thousand people a day and our urban areas are expanding, that's less farm ground, right? Everybody knows that. But like, how do we work through that? Do we just throw stuff at each other or do we work on solutions? You know, and so that's what these kids are working on. And so for each one of those wicked problems, we've hired a challenge coordinator that builds curriculum around that issue to help them understand that. Because at the end of the day, we want young people, bright minds, working on these hard problems together to come up with a solution that we actually can use. It's not like a, it's not busy work. It's not an exercise. Mm -hmm. Because if you looked at the average age of the people that put the man on the moon, it's shocking. It's in the twenties. Yep. Yep. So young people, yeah, right. Uh, no, it's they, they were inventing math that had not been developed. Yet. So mm -hmm. why should we think that if we These are recruiting talent yeah. in Harris County and then from all over the state of Texas on a rural side that they can't come up with something interesting and unique. So those are the four issues they're going to be working on. Yep. So I think it's really interesting that you're bringing people to that may not have the same perspective of all of us that may have grown up in, in agriculture to, to help address our, our problems. Right. Um, so what we talk about a lot is you can't solve wicked problems with a choir. Yep. You truly can. All the research says that if it's complex and hard, you have to have lots of different perspectives and backgrounds at the yes. table. So if you if you look and you talk to our group, it's going to look different and sound different than any other extension program that I've been a part of. Yep. And and that's what's so refreshing and necessary you, and necessary. And you get those different. You, you're like, oh, shoot, I never thought about it. That mm -hmm. way. But you do, because that's that's your world. That's your lens that you're seeing it from. And so there's nothing earth shattering there other than we are very purposeful in trying to get we have graphic designers. We have people that are going into the arts. We have biomedical kids. We have kids that have listed Harvard, you know, as schools mm -hmm. they'd like to go to. Uh, you know, super bright, super diverse group. And just, we were just looking for a diversity of background, and we absolutely got it. Yep. So, Billy, I think the story is, is pretty awesome about getting this program, you know, off the ground. So, as I think about Capital Farm Credit, what, I mean, I think I work with some of the most passionate, passionate people about agriculture that there are. But if we consider our business and our future viability, it's, it's really dependent on the development of that next generation of agricultural producer. So I'm, I'm, I find myself sitting here listening to you thinking about how do we reconcile, you know, some of the things that we're accomplishing with this program, with developing that next generation producer uh, of the future. Y'all absolutely get it. And that's why um, Capital Farm Credit was such a good fit for the planting phase, like symbolically, like you all get so many ag enterprises off the ground and up and going. So you are grow you are planting for us, you know? And so, um, yeah, we're, we're aware of the aging farmer, right? We get it. We understand it. Uh, but what we're doing is introducing different backgrounds to agriculture and having them consider a career potentially that they hadn't before. Or maybe they were biomedical or maybe they were just biology, but maybe they didn't know that there were opportunities over here in animal science. And maybe they just forget us completely, and that's cool too. But we help them. We help them understand, you know, um, who we are. Right. And so we have a. We have. A, so when we get to harvest, you know, if I can jump ahead, we'll be back here, and we're going to actually harvest that we, we planted, you know, in November, and we're going to mill it. And we're going to do some different things with it. But one of the capstone experiences is going to be on a ranch with a ranch family, helping them understand. We want them to know that this isn't just some, this isn't some lady on a tractor. This isn't some guy on a tractor. These are family, the, 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 the falsehood that is the factory farm, you know, that it's corporate and all these things. It just, it's just not true. In a lot of cases, it's just not true. So if we bring them to a family farm, they're gonna see the family aspect. And that's something we want, want them to do. And so what I'm getting at there is that if, if Tommy, which is another one of, uh, one of my favorites that's in inside 610 who's who wants to be a graphic designer he doesn't know he doesn't go into agriculture and that's great but if we've identified him as a leader in his community he's going to know something about us. you know he's going to know 
he's going to know what that family aspect was. He's going to know something about that these people are smart people and they're trying to help me, right? And they cared about me. And I think if we can do that and then at the same time pick a couple up that do, you know, maybe they, maybe they, Joe, maybe they don't go large scale ag production, but maybe they buy five acres and maybe they have two cows and a, and a horse or some chickens. It won't be one, but it'll be somebody that has some chickens. You can yeah. either get them involved in ag or you get them involved as an advocate. For That's ag. right. It's a win-win. That's right. And Joe then, took the words out of my mouth. And then, yeah. And then on the flip side, it's like, how can we be an advocate for you? Yep. Like, how can we get but our... That's so important, and I don't yeah. think we focus on that enough. Yeah. Because they need to feel like they get something out of it on their end, too. Absolutely. And yeah. you're doing that, and I think yeah. that's they're, so commendable. Yeah, you know, they're they're not a photo op. Yep. We truly care in their development. And so because that... Because that'll make them even more... Yeah, and that's, an advocate and that's been the thing is like, you know, getting... How do I get somebody that's inside 610 to trust me and say, like, look, we really do care about your development? Because one of the things that y- that y'all are helping us with is is offering a twenty five hundred dollar educational grant for these students, and that money will follow them if they go to Harvard, if they go to a if they go to a trade school, it's going to follow them wherever they go. And so that's our way of saying, look, we we care about your development. You know, we we care. Like we are invested in you, and you don't have to buy ten acres for us <laughs> to care about you. We're going to care about you if you're a nurse you're a firefighter, whatever you are, we care about you. And that's the message we want to send them. And then more than that, we want to make it scalable because we're talking about 18 kids. It's not very many. Their impact and reach can be a lot, but how can it spread? How can we, how can we do this in Kansas city, you know, or Dallas or San Antonio? We have ideas about that. I I want to give you credit for a minute because you've developed this and you've put a ton of work in it. And so you should commend yourself as well. well and, and you're not the kind of man that will. So let us. No, no, no. That, that, that's very kind of you. But what you need to know is like, I'm a shameless thief. Like I've, and I think I've outlined. Well, you. then you're really good at <laughs> yeah. putting things together. So, so you no, put, I, you put a commendable thing together. Well, definitely. thank you. No, but I, I absolutely borrowed from lots of different things. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, by my interaction with the tall program and leadership extension things and, uh, you know, our ambassador programs and, and just, I'm always looking for ways. I see the world through a lens of like, how can it help sure. young people in agriculture? And so when you see things that way, you can be listening to a podcast from Malcolm Gladwell and go, oh my goodness, Stanford's on to something, yep. you know, and then how do we incorporate that? Or if I'm at a ranch in Argentina, like how can that challenge? Oh, well, yeah. So the challenge really is water, you know? Yep. So uh, as we kind of wind this down, I've got one question for you. You mentioned some readings from Dr. Borlaug, I believe, earlier. Could you, just for my, myself and then our listeners, could you say what those books were? There's so many. Um, but the one that I keep circling back to is Our Daily Bread. Okay. Uh, that is a great one. It's on Amazon or anywhere you want to buy books. Right. But Our Daily Bread is one that I thought laid out his life and work. Awesome. Uh, pretty, pretty incredible. Awesome. We're, Billy, we're really proud to have you on our podcast. Thank you for having us. And as a 4-H kid, I want to thank you for all that you've done and continue to do for the kids of agriculture. Awesome. Well, I I would be remiss if I didn't mention our great team and and Dr. Gable and Kelly Ranley with TYLA. Um, They're really the ones that put all this together and make it work. And uh, as I mentioned, our great partners that that kind of gotten us off the ground. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on Capital Roots. Texas agriculture is the foundation of our story and what makes us family. Capital Farm Credit is a proud member of the farm credit system. We finance farmers, ranchers, agricultural producers, and rural landowners, and we're here to make your vision a reality. We've been serving rural Texas for more than a century. Whether it be traditional, innovative, or lifestyle, we'll help you cultivate new ground. We're all in this together. Because together, we're better.